everybody. My name is Wari Boko Semenitari, and I am the president of the ACC, the Artists of Color Coalition at the University of Minnesota. Um, today, we are starting the first chapter of our sit down series with the incomparable Marlies Yerby. Marlies Yerby is an artist, activist, choreographer, and director with a global perspective. She creates original works across various platforms, including theater, film, and diverse multimedia. Miss Yerby developed her in Our Bones creative process as an acknowledgement of the legacies, lived experiences, memories, and day-to-day -day energies ever presenting in the moving bodies of at work. Miss Yerby's work is internationally recognized. She is the Tony Award nominated and Dora Award nominated choreographer of the musical Rent. And she received the Drama League Award for the Los Angeles production of Rent. Her work was licensed for the movie production of Rent. And she is the choreographer of the cine cinecast of Rent's final Broadway performance. She remounted the Broadway version of the original production for the 20th anniversary tour of Rent, which is now in its fifth year and to remount in 2021 as the final farewell rent 25th anniversary tour. She has gained critical acclaim for her role as the director and choreographer of composer Craig Harris's Brown Butterfly, a multimedia celebration of the life and times of Muhammad Ali, the greatest. Miss Yerby was the founder and director of Moving Spirits Dance Theater and received commissions from Harlem Stages, Kansas Lead Center for the Performing Arts, Mass Mocha, the Exit Festival France, PS122, the American Dance Festival, Lincoln Center Outdoors, and Jacob's Pillow, to name a few. Miss Yerby has had the pleasure of directing works from writers Lori Carlos, Saku Sundiata, Carl Hancock Rux, and Nadine Mozan. Miss Yerby is the director and founder of the Project Dance Hackett, a virtual performance space for artists live streamed. Moore's Salt City and Af Miss recently Miss Yerby directed and choreo choreographed in collaboration with Aku Kadogo on poet Jessica Kerr Moore's Salt City, an Afrofuturistic fantasy inspired by the salt mines of Detroit. Miss Yerby adapted Miss Moore's Salt City poems into a script for the stage through her role as dramaturg. This adaptation was performed at the Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit, Michigan. Currently, Miss, Yer Miss Yerby is musing her newest project, Seed Awakening on the Eve of Blue, addressing the crisis in real food, environment, and health as commodity in disenfranchised communities globally and right here at home. She soon will be minting her first minting, mounting her first digital NFT for the blockchain and is thrilled to collaborate with artists and to share these collaborations in this new way. And now, ladies and gentlemen, and those who identify otherwise, Miss Marlies Yerby. It is such an honor to be chatting with you today. How are you? I'm fine. It's so great to be here with you, Ari. Thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. I believe we have a mutual friend, Mr. Um, Professor Talvin Wilkes, who's yes. at the University of Minnesota. Yes, longtime collaborator, friend, and definitely someone who has majorly influenced my work over the years. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. I really want to start. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. I think we are in great hands. <laughs> we are we are i really want to start at the top so san jose state biology major where let's let's start there what 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 was that the story where'd that start and that love of dance yes to dance well you know now that i'm looking backwards in time i know that my love of dance was grown from my mother because mm -hmm. she was an interpretive dancer and jazz singer of her time and she used to drag me to hear live jazz music all the time. And so, and I would watch her dance. And I realized the first time that I improvised to, and saw myself on tape improvising was with Ralph Peterson Jr., uh, who was an amazing jazz drummer. And when I looked at myself, I realized I was dancing my mother's feet. So I believe it was poured into my body, dance in that way. And then the biological sciences you know, you get ready to go to college and there's that little message in your head that has to do with stability. You know, make sure that you study something that you can lean on. And really, I wasn't even speaking about dance as a major at all at that time. And my mother side glanced me, but she never said anything. And it really wasn't until I took a dance class the following semester to just sort of 
breathe because science has such intensity, yeah? Mm -hmm. And found myself taking all dance classes that following semester. And then realizing that I was really doing dance. And then at that point, I switched to that major. Yeah, so that's biological science story. <laughs> it was a choice that I was doing to try to, you know, do the right thing. I love that. Yeah. I love that that's Spike Lee right. reference too. Yeah. yeah, the right thing is doing you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I love the image you talk about with dance of it being poured into you. Is that where you sort of find a lot of your creative beginnings and ideas for choreographing and like working as an artist? The oh, thoughts of the magic like being poured in? Yes, definitely. I feel like a, I, I call it a download. I'm having a download. And um, anybody who's worked with me knows that if I go into a quiet space, they just keep doing what they're doing. I'm thinking, I'm seeing it. I can see it behind my lens. Uh, sometimes what I'm seeing, I have no idea how to actually execute because sometimes it's that wild. Mm. But most times it is giving me great clarity as to the next step. And oftentimes the bodies that are in the room, I'm also picking up the energy of who they are in, in relationship to the story that I'm trying to tell, whether it be a non-linear story or a more, a story that's based on the script. All of those things are informing me all the time, everything, every action, every way that they embody on and off doing, doing the character work, um, the music, how it's playing, the dialogue around uh, the process of creating, all of it, yeah. I want to talk about your dance career now. Um, so graduated from San Jose State, what, well, can you talk about the beginnings of your dance career and like growing into the dance artist that you are now, kind of just mapping the roadway to when you got that call for Rent? And then we'll talk about Rent following that. Okay. Well, Rari, first of all, I did not graduate from San Jose State University and don't oh. feel bad that you said that because people make that assumption. But I actually hung out at San Jose State University in that dance department taking every choreography class I could, every production class I could, and was choreographing outside of the school with a company called Bobby Winning Company at that time in San Jose, running back and forth and doing community theater. I was a terrible student, but I was very busy in my artistry. And at one point, the uh, director of the department, the, the dean of the department came over and said, you know, you're really doing everything that you're going to school for. Are you sure you don't want to just take a break for a couple of years and see how it goes and then come back? And I told her, okay, let me think on that. And what I did was I took a year off and just full-time worked as an artist to see if I could do it. It was hard. It was not easy because I was not in a market that really supported dance. But I did it and then came back and decided to leave, thinking I would come back. But then I hit New York and the story's rewritten from there, never came back. Yeah, so I did not graduate. Mm -hmm. And that is the beginning of the journey that led me to rent. And how I really got rent was that my company, Moving Spirits Dance Theater, I was doing works on the company that is very much dance theater based oftentimes working with writers in the collaboration of building those works. And uh, along the way also would step into their bodies of work. Matter of fact, the work, one of the works that I had done uh, the year before that brought me a video that was a part of the submission that I did for Rent was a piece called Vanquished by Voodoo. And it was done by Lori Carlos. She was the writer of it and she directed it and it was an installment piece an installation piece and i choreographed it so that tape and the tape of my company moving spirits dance theater i got a call from linda chapman over at new york theater workshop asking me to submit that tape and it was many years later that i found out that who submitted that tape who who suggested me was mark russell over at ps122 
yes, who was a major champion of my work and the work that I did with Lori Carlos. So that is how that happened. Yeah. I want to talk about choreographing Rent itself. A beautiful thing, at least for me, when I was watching Rent, at least my first introduction to Rent was um, the movie version. And um, then, of course, being the theater nerd that I am, I went back and started to look at like the production. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I want to talk about first is like with choreographing Rent, the production, those movements, how it's so like, it's complex, but it's such human gestures that we do in our everyday lives. And how like, if the music would like pick up, sometimes you would have a head like pitter off into different heads or even like the movement of La Vie Boheme and like just that first moment. What, I will start there. Like what was the inspiration? What was the liquid that was poured into you? What poured into you when choreographing La Vie Boheme, that big scene and Rent, <laughs> whichever start works best. Right, right. Well, you know, two things happened for me. I had actually just come back from a museum tour with a friend of mine. And in that museum tour, I was looking at Basquiat's work and I was looking at uh, the Dada movement. And in the course of that, I had this thought in my mind about revolution and how dance can be a revolution. It can be a, uh, in itself, a, um, a, a, a commitment to voicing how one feels. So, and I was thinking about Basquiat and how he has these gestures, all of these gestures uh, in his artistry that communicate something that is a complex story. I love that word. I'm gonna adapt that, Rory. It's a complex <laughs> story. It has many levels and shades. It's not just one idea all the time. And that work spoke to me. So it already had that in the back of my mind. When it was time to do La Vie Boheme, it was a combination of really listening to the artistry in the room, listening to Michael uh, Greif talk about La Vie Boheme, listening to this, this place where um, the act of the, 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 the issues around health as it connected to AIDS, um, Listening to that dynamic was in the back of my mind about what it is to stand up and give voice with no shame. What it is to be identified as who you are and speak out with no shame, with clarity, with joy from that place. So all of those things were running to my mind. And so the little dance at the top, the shoulders and the head swing and all of that really came out of being defiant. You know, at that age in particular, the age of the cast uh, um, as, as, as the characters on stage, they were in a state of defiance and had a lot to be defiant about. Their, um, their uh, a community was going to be gentrified. No one ever talks too much about that, but that was definitely a part of it. And so all of those things coming together in that top dance was really about putting Benny in his place, claiming the right to, yes, and being boldly present. And then it went from there, really captivating what each artist in the space could bring in their embodiment of the movement and giving some freedom for that and then shaping it and shaping it and shaping it until it locked itself down to something that breathed together sometimes and yet expressed the individuality of who we are and the community of we, who, we, who we are and the voice of, and we will not be put down. Wow. I, wow. I never really like thought, like it just, I love the, the way you say defiance and how like you were shaping this defines through everyone's attitudes and how it like just trickled off throughout that whole show. Now I wonder like with defiance and shaping defiance, how has defiance in itself changed across your choreographing, chore choreography career? Because I feel sometimes as a black artist myself, writing black joy for me is a way of like writing against the Western theatrical canon because I did not see enough of Black Joy in that way. So I wonder for you, where do you find shaping defiance and like how has that defiance changed across your career as a Black female artist working across many different scopes, be it choreography or directing? 
Yes. Woo, I love it. Okay, so <laughs> first, off, first off, it is beautiful. Black joy, beautiful. And yes, that in itself is a defiance. Um, you know, it was very important for me in the context of the work that we did that there was always something claiming something that was said was no longer ours. Our story, not through the, through the lens of, the, of, a, of a gaze that was not our own. Um, and sometimes our own gaze gets really distorted because we've been so um, taught to think and breathe and live in a certain container. So my thing was always about busting out of the container, breaking the fourth wall, um, living on stage, breathing, interacting, connecting, making eye contact, being present with each other. The touches had to be uh, touches that were not there as a device, but the touches needed to communicate something. Um, so whether I was doing something as a big gesture, I remember Craig Harris, when he brought me in on the Brown Butterfly Project as an example, which is a lovely example, he said to me, Marlise, I built the rhythm of the music out of watching Muhammad Ali do his dance mm. in the ring. And so then I started thinking, which was not in his head at the time, I was thinking, but what birthed that dance? And so then I started looking at the realities of what he was living in and the boldness of his I amness in itself, like a, a direct defiance against the <laughs> the signs that were still up in the South that said, you can't drink from this water pot, you can't be here. Um, the, the racist institutionalized modalities that were there to claim spirit and deconstruct. The sharpness of the entertainers on stage, they looked a certain way, pinned up, dressed up. Ah, you know, every gesture, every dance gesture was um, specific in unison, breathing together, hitting that note in that music, all of those things. And at, yet simultaneously, you will, you, any given moment, being hosed down for being Black. So I said, you know, I believed that his dance came from the environment by which he lived. And when he was on stage doing that dance, jabbing and, and jiving, he was not only making a statement in the ring and mixing up his opponent's uh, uh, psyche to get him thrown off, he was also bolstering his own self up to be up in it no matter what. Yeah? yeah. And so we needed to find the I amness in order to do Brown Butterfly, you know? And I remember uh, one of the reviewers, uh, Jennifer Dunning said, you know, it, it wasn't intimate. It was, it seemed to seek a grandeur. And in that sense, the intimacy was the music. It was the instrument relationship to how Craig Harris played his trombone, lip to the trombone, those solo moments that he stepped out those moments that the dancers breathe in unison with him. The intimacy was in the connection of all of us being there together through this defiance. So, and I think of my work always sort of striping that. Um, when I did a piece called In the Image of a Darker Truth, it really was built around nursery rhymes, yes? But the story that it was imparting at the time um, was really talking about a modern day lynching. And Carl Hancock Rupps, who's another amazing writer, was in that, uh, in that piece with, with me and the dancers. We were all telling this story that was about embodying, again, there's a sense of I amness there, in spite of the gestures that were meant to deconstruct. And I will never forget when, the, when, it, when we completed that performance, 
there was a review that came out and the reviewer said, gender issues are more in the mind of people right now than race issues. And shortly thereafter that, literally that week, the Rodney King riots broke out. And so there's always, my work has always been a step forward of what is going on. And that has continued to be present. And I would say, you know, my first piece of choreography that I did was about a woman stuck in an office wanting to be herself but stuck doing this work and it was called the sometimes crazy and she needed to do this work to survive. So she was constantly repeating these cycles of gestures, trying to get out of this loop and she couldn't find her way out, yeah? And so I think there's always been a sense of where am I now and the story that needs to be told in the now, in that moment and how it relates to me and how it relates to a script if I have a script or a collaborator if they're bringing me in on a concept, but always being authentic to bring myself forward in it and how I see it, how I might envision it. Um, now I wonder, cause you talk about um, Muhammad Ali's dance and where it came from and asking that question and like where you are now. And so now my next question for you is, where is like your work now? What, what, where is your dance? And where is that like dance coming from? from <laughs> seeing 2020 and all these things come out from our in our industry from we see you white American theater, seeing the protests, seeing George Floyd, seeing the news, seeing the first black Asian female vice president. I wonder now like all these things trickling down and moving so fast. Like I felt like a decade moved through one year till now. I wonder where is your dance now and where is your artistry now? And what, what are you seeking out? and what are you building on? Yeah. Well, you know, where I left off at, I was dreaming this piece called Seed Awakening on the Eve of Blue. And it really um, was born out of so many people dying around me. And for, um, and, and those people that were dying around me, I was acutely aware of the impact of what we were eating the processed food, the GMO food, the, uh, the food that is not real. And I began to wonder like, what is, it to, what is it doing in the body and the bodies of our communities? How is it impacting the way we think, the way we are able to um, process information? And is it a slow death? Is it another slow hanging? So I began thinking about that. And that's where I left off in my creative mind. I was thinking about that while I waited for Talvin Wilkes to come up with his next <laughs> great work because I really <laughs> look forward to working with Talvin. And um, so I, I was really thinking about that pre-COVID. And as everybody was experiencing, COVID shut down everything. You know, um, my tour shut down and the first thing that happened was, I think I stepped into a quiet place. And inside of that quiet place, I made contacts and relationships with people geographically in many places. And in the course of that was really studying um, philosophies around who are we, you know? And where do we go if we're not here? and just slow down to begin to think about that and listen to myself. And out of that listening space, next thing I know, I found myself writing poetry. I'm like, I don't write poetry, but I have a lot of poetry that I've written. And uh, right now it seems to be doing two things. And I realized that it is probably uh, a piece that I wanted to do a long time ago that I never did called Identity Play. And I wanted to do this piece on identities. And so these voices that are coming out of me right now is um, a story of a woman, uh, a she coming into herself and finding her own um, path beyond the borders of skin. And what I mean by the beyond the borders of skin, beyond the borders of how the body is contained. 
I started thinking about um, astral travel out of the body and what is that? What is that? You know, how do we live beyond? Is there, you know, and certainly a residue of Salt City. How do we move through portals of time to another kind of, you know, um, way of looking at the world? So I was thinking of that. And then I was really thinking about this identity of a Black man who uh, is trying to move beyond the identity of Black, the identity of color, the identity of any of it to be himself, whatever that meant. And I, um, so those are the, the pieces of poetry that are pulling out of me. And then in the course of that, I uh, heard about this world called NFTs, which is non-fungible tokens. I met this incredible woman named Lady Phoenix. And in the course of that learning, I started visioning how work can happen beyond the constraints of geography, beyond the constraints of being in a, in a theater. If this continued to go, how could I make work that still shared a story that still impacted someone, you know? Um, and so I have been really inspired listening to a lot of visual artists and how they're working uh, and composers and how they're working. And so I'm working on a project that will be brewing for a while that is taking the identity plays and playing on the independence that can occur on the blockchain. Would you say the identity plays are, um, some of them are like autobiographical in some ways? I don't feel like I'm writing autobiographical. I feel, but it may very well be. I mean, certainly I do believe uh, myself in um, life beyond this container is living. I have evidence of that, you know, in my life, you know. Yeah. Uh, from people that I have lost over time. Yeah, I still interact with them in a very present way. So I definitely think that there's some real relationship, but I don't know that it's autobiographical. But what it is happening is um, the first wife, there's a, a gentleman, Byron Utley, who was in Rent. Yes, he was one of the original Rent players. And we were having a conversation. Um, he played Mr. Jefferson. And we were having a conversation and certainly that next day he was talking about his life and as a black man identified and and the times in his life that it has been um used against him you know and how he was standing strong through that and in insisting on a black joy yeah mm -hmm. and so that very next day that download came that download came that was really, I, I sent it to him because I said, this must be inspired from you. But then there's been three more insertions from it. So I know that it's gonna come together. Sometimes it's good to just listen, let it keep happening. You know, downloads are precious. They are gifts, you know? So I am receiving those gifts and, and I am not trying to predetermine what that's gonna look like. But I know that it's going to, um, I'm going to play with it existing in a different form digitally. Yeah. Sometimes, so with, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say sometimes as an artist, I find myself in this place where I'm not paying enough attention to the download and listening. And I just wonder, like, for you, when was the moment that you started to not necessarily like, I don't want to say slow down yourself, but like slow, like take, actually take it in and like slow down and listen to the world and listen, find your download as an artist. When did that moment start for you? Mm, well, I know Talvin Wilkes greatly influenced that for me. We were working on a project um, called Feathers at the Flame. And then there was Feathers at the Flame Next Dance. And he was, he was in the insertion at Feathers of the Flame Next Dance. But we had worked together many times before that. But in that particular time frame, when you're in residence, oh, residencies, I love residencies. Because when you're in residence, it really, as an artist, gives you the time 
to digest it, you know, to dig in, to eat it, to sleep it, to breathe it without interruption. And so we were in one of those moments and um, really beginning to ask the questions of where, where are we now in this moment of creation? Where are we now? Who are we now? Um, what is the purpose of the meeting now? What is the purpose of even the simple gesture? I began to look for great detail, you know, in that time period. In an earlier time period, the music relationship, I was in a residency. So residencies are hugely important. I need more residency. But in, in a residency at American Dance Festival, I had an opportunity to work with an amazing artist, Jing Jing Lao, who was a composer. And she was hearing how I was utilizing the breath in the room, which was really my way to count. I wanted the artist to use their breath to count versus their numbers. I don't like numbers because numbers are very specific and it gives not enough room to breathe into the choreography. Yeah. And so she heard the breath and she heard that as music and she's actually composed around the breath. So it was the first time that I started listening to the breath as something that is communicating more than rhythm and timing. So that was definitely a shift in the download. Um, yeah, little inserts along the way, little inserts, but those are two that just really pop out at me. And then I found myself over time, I noticed that I watch people, I'm a people watcher. So I'm constantly aware of the movement of people. And right now I'm, I'm in, a, in a state where I'm in nature right now. And I don't get to be in nature like I'm in nature right now. So I'm acutely aware right now of the shifts in the environment of when things flower, of when things of when of the birds, the way they sing that shift and what comes alive at night versus what is silent at night and at what time in the year. So I think that that is in preparation of my seed awakening project, which is very much about, you know, wanting a journey, wanting to see a journey forward to real food that is, that is grown again from real seed, but also acutely aware after having so many experiences this last year, both with crises in weather and both in um, crises due to, to the health situation where the food channels just shut down. And what does it mean now? You know, suddenly I'm collecting canned food for the event of something that I would not even normally eat myself. I like fresh food, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think when you ask me, you know, how does the listening, I call myself a deep body listener. And that has really grown out of many gestures allowing me to listen in different ways. And then I discovered myself uh, that last gesture of, of listening or not the last, but one a very important gesture of listening along the way was when I did my project Woman Moves. And that project, it was about listening to the container of women around the simple question that I asked them at that time because this is before we described uh, ourselves in the uh, pronouns that we're describe, describing ourselves now. And I asked the question of, when did you first discover yourself a woman? Mm -hmm. And the answers that came back to me were amazing from someone who was in their 80s, still undefined as a woman, from someone who said when she was standing at the, on, on, on a stool, in front of a stove at three years old, turning a pot, to um, um, to so many answers and responses, and I started doing workshops because I was like, "Wow, I gotta, I gotta dig deeper." So I'm gonna do these workshops, and inside of the workshops, I was working with a woman named Neoka Workman, who's an amazing composer, and she's playing this music, and I'm watching the bodies and directing them into themselves, getting them to breathe and interact. And I started noticing that 
as we were moving through these guided um, moving meditations, I would notice that some of the women's bodies were locked up around the hips or locked up on the left side and moving on the right, very moving on the right, but not moving on the left, that sort of thing. And started working with instruction, breath, toning that started opening up that side of the body. And suddenly now it started freeing up. And then what would come with that freeing? Yes, sometimes it was a story of, 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 of a disruption in their life. Sometimes it was um, tears, sometimes it was uncontrollable laughter. And then I really started thinking about how the body holds so much. Yeah. So that listening space, it is, it, it is an evolved space. You know, you talk about how you asked them, when did you know they were, they were, they were a woman? And now I ask this question, I mean, when did it, when did you know you were, I'm going to throw the question back at you now, but in a different way. <laughs> when did you know you were a Black female artist? Because mm. I feel like sometimes as Black artists in training, I find myself in other than in this too, you start to be like, I'm not just a Black act, act, actor. I'm not just a Black actor. I'm not just a Black actor. But then for me, as I've been going in my training, I've been doing this, this garment, this gesture of like, I am a Black actor and you will take my Blackness for what it is, no matter what space I may be. And so now I ask you that question. I mean, when did you know? I, I know I know my moment, but when did you know that moment of I am a Black female artist and like this does come through in my work and my gesture in some way? Yeah. You know, I never thought mm, my identity as a Black female artist was always present in my work. Hmm. So I never thought of myself in a way that I needed to define myself as Black. So I never put out front that I am I, Black artist, this, that, and that, and the other. Mm -hmm. But certainly in the last, I would say, the last five years in particular, maybe 10, maybe 10 years, I have been realizing that, particularly with Rent, I don't think a lot of people knew that it was a Black choreographer that choreographed Rent. No, no I don't think a lot of people knew that. And um, so I started thinking about the fact that a lot of people didn't know that. <laughs> I think that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, oh, that not that interesting? You know, that a lot of people didn't know that. Because I feel like, you know, I'm, I have these beautiful big lips and this beautiful wide nose and this forehead. And, you know, um, so my Africanism is all over my face, you know? So I don't think, I didn't think that I needed to define that. And then I, my work was always speaking to the culture. It was always speaking to the culture. And you asked something earlier, and I don't even know if I answered it, or did you ask, and this was free, you said, you know, and what has your work been when it has been on white bodies? Was that you who asked me that? Oh yeah, I was actually going to ask that. It was a, it's a question that's supposed to come on, come up. Actually, we can well, actually jump into it. The difference between it like, up. okay, great. What well, is the difference in choreographing <laughs> on like different bodies? Yes. Well, you know, and and that is interesting too because when I think about my work, most of the productions that I've done. Uh, in my own company, Movement Spirits Dance Theater, we were we were BIPOC, pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we were BIPOC. We were before it was a trend and safety net. Yeah, it, before it was a exactly. trend, we were BIPOC. Yeah. So um, so I definitely didn't experience it there. And even when I was in uh, San Jose and I was choreographing on um, Bobby Wynn and Company, there was one white person in the company. Everyone else was BIPOC. Um, and rent, you know, really, yes, there were more white people in rent. Yes. And so, and that was interesting. And I definitely like like Anthony rap, you know, when I choreographed on him, I loved the way he moved, the way he just embodied a quirkiness that was his. And, you know, definitely um, uh, deep dive into that body and loved that body because it danced in its own offbeat measure without apology it was it was it was him and i love that about him you know 
But when I went to um, teach for the summers, you know, uh, at the Drucker School of the Arts, they did a jazz and contemporary dance intensive in the summer. And so I started playing rounds there in the summer. And oftentimes the cast was majority uh, European American. They were the majority of that. And um, I would make sure to try to mix because I needed that room to be mixed for the dialogues to really happen. And um, it was fascinating because I think time has shifted people's understanding of music, of breath, and, and how their body can tell a story, very different than, you know, even as early as, as 20 years ago, I would say, you know, um, the, the cross section of who listens to what type of music and where does the body live in that beat is very different than back when I was, you know, beginning to choreograph, um, bodies couldn't all dance the same beat and rhythm. You know, that had to be taught, yeah? So what that experience is like doing it on anyone else, I did not look at them as, oh, you're um, gonna move this particular way because you're this. Again, my authenticity means that I have to allow the people that are in front of me to be authentic to who they are. So. I'm always interested in how people interpret the movement that I put out because how it feels on my body. Sometimes I'll turn around and look and I'm like, wow, really? That looks nothing like I imagined it in my head, you know, <laughs> in a good way, though, in a good way, not necessarily in a like, whoa, shocking, you know, and to cultivate that, you know, and to let it inform me. Um, so I think, I didn't think of them as being um, different once we got up in the room. If they had the juice, they need to be able to commit to the emotional life and go there. And if you can't go there, then I don't care what color you are, then the work and, and working with me is not the place to be. Because I need the full embodiment of it which means that you're committing on layers, layers of yourself are entering into that, into that, that uh, story. Yeah. Can you talk about, uh, I know you brought up Rent again in like that moment of like choreographing different bodies. And I just wonder, could you talk about your relationship with Jonathan Larson, like in that process and what that meant? For well, you, you know, like just I mean, just working together, really, just the human connection you guys had in that process. What was that like? You know, Jonathan. When I first met Jonathan, he was very excited that I had the capacity as a, a choreographer to not only make big dance gestures, but to also um, really humanize the the characters on the stage. And I loved that he saw that in my work and um, honored that about him. I could tell that he had an understanding of choreographers and later found out from him as I was working in the room with him that he has uh, real relationships with choreographers and dancers. So it's, it's, it, it is a craft that he respected, you know, and you can tell by the way he um, talked to me about it. Um, now, interestingly enough, I just found him, I watched him probably more than he um, watched me in that sense, you know? And that was because I found him completely without apology, standing up for any particular thought he had around his work and his craft, you know? And how he felt like it should be seen, you know? And then sometimes he would tap me and just sort of encourage he would encourage, um, yeah, you know, keep, you know, keep exploring that way. Yeah, I like that, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So Jonathan, I, I just loved his boldness in the room. He was a very present writer in the room. And that was great. To me, that was great. I was like, it gave full permission, you know, as an artist to speak out 
for what you needed and how you needed it. So I, I really respect and honor him for that. You know, yeah. the beautiful thing about rent as a project and like just what you said about speaking out about what you needed, this, there's a lot of struggles that the Amer as Americans we are facing today mm -hmm. that a lot of the characters in rent are facing. Like the first song is we're not gonna pay rent and like the prices of gentrification. And I just wonder like for you as an artist, what is the difference between creating and choreographing in a time that was like moving like in a play that was so centered on like the AIDS movement moving from a time where it was like the 90s, the heat of the AIDS movement and like all of these brand new techniques coming out versus like an artist now still like choreographing in the middle of the pandemic and like work. I know you talk about listening to the world and taking in the breath of the world, like work in a pandemic and like work then like how are, what are the similarities and what are their, um, I, won't, I don't want to say disparities because it would have been a fun way to rhyme, but I'm going to say um, the differences <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> what are those? What's, what's the bridge and what's what, where, and where does it, where, where does the gap begin? I wonder. I their separation. I'm not there in the room with you. Yeah, that's the first gap. I'm not there <laughs> in the room with you, sitting next to you, talking with the camera facing both of us going out. Yeah. So that first place is that um, I'm not able to touch your body. Yeah. And that, but that kind of began to begin. There was a climate that was beginning, which maybe was partially born out of the Me Too movement. But slowly but surely, there was this sensation of no more touch direction, no more touching. And how do you move through that as, as artists, as performing artists? You got to touch. You know, and now we have this this um, distancing for our health and well being, but we are a tactile race of people. We are, and I'm not talking about any particular culture. I'm talking about we need touch. We do need touch. We need to touch each other. You know, um, so in this container since COVID, I've not been in a studio with anyone, you know? My studio is out in nature. You know, I'll sometimes go out in nature and, and, and work that way because I don't have space where I'm at to work, you know, in that kind of a way. Um, so again, I think I've been writing more. So the idea of coming back into, now we're talking about, you know, mounting again and, and getting back to the theater. And we don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of questions that we have. Now we know that it's gotta be fixed somehow or some way because arts are absolutely important. They are an important part of living and have been, I would say in ancient times, dance, music, you know, the visual artistry was always present. It was, serving um, ritual, you know, it was serving an expression of something in society. So, but still it is a necessary component, you know, it gives a voice, especially um, voices that are trying to communicate something. It gives a voice, you know. So post COVID, first piece I'm thinking of doing is digital. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. in this container, somehow. Yeah, that's where it will breathe. And I wonder, what is it like? Because I know Dance Hackett is very digital. What is it like choreographing without being able to touch, but on a platform like Zoom as we are now? If I were your dancer, like, what would that be like? That process, and how would you be like, you know, take in to pour into you to like create that? beautiful piece of magic. How would you go about that, I wonder? Yeah. Well, you know, interestingly enough, um, the first Zoom rehearsals I had was a beautiful choreographer who used to dance with me called T. Lang. Mm. And uh, T. Lang dances, is she's based in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And she wanted me to do some dramaturgical work with a piece that she was building. Uh, and the dramaturgical work was like the work that Talvin did with me and that it's about the embodiment of the work. So I'm, I'm looking at her choreography and working from that container. Well, we had to start 
online due to budget and other things. So we started, I would watch her in her living room and we would start, you know, going through that process there. So I don't think that the process of um, choreographing digitally, long distance, giving notes, um, rehearsing that way, I don't think that that's a, a foreign body. What I think is um, amazing is that the capacity of potentially creating without geographic concern where you could have um, dancers in various environments, you know, or um, actors in various environments. And I, I mean, it's like you said, you're doing digital plays, you're doing mm -hmm. Zoom plays, you know, you're figuring it out. My thing is, is there a way for us to get rid of the square or to utilize the square in such a way that it's not constraining the sense of how we are viewing it, you know? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm looking at that. And I think that there is something very powerful about, about um, uh, utilizing the frame in such a way that it brings the eye beyond the square box. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so I think, and, and I think that visual artists have done really well with that. They bring you into the art, not necessarily the frame that you're looking at. You don't necessarily yeah. see the edges, you see the work. And I don't think dance has done that very well yet, um, except for when it's shot for the screen, you know? So yeah, I'm very interested to see how it all comes together. But moving beyond the, gra the, the boundaries of geography, I think is beautiful because it allows the container to be very rich, to be very, very rich, to have culturally um, people from all over. That could be an amazing thing. Yeah. So we have some questions um, okay. from Facebook. Um, someone says, can Marlies talk about, talk more about the formation of her company, Moving Spirits Dance Theater, and what her early works were exploring, and some of your early collaborators? Oh, okay, absolutely, I can do that. Um, Moving Spirits Dance Theater was formed in, loosely, in 1989, and our first performances were at the Brooklyn Arts and Culture, which was called Back at that time. And um, I think it's still called Back now for short. And then also at um, Marymount College. Um, and that was where, well, actually at Marymount College, I called it The Pot. And then when we went to Back, it was called uh, Moving Spirits Dance Theater. And the work was really born out of wanting a container to really voice this idea of collaboration. And that those collaborations could build a bridge of understanding of who we are on so many layers um, across various cultures, across various races, yes, um, across various identities, and that we could potentially have a larger conversation. And for me, that meant that I needed to be in the room with um, different composers. I needed live music. Live music became very important. And I made a huge commitment when I made Moving Spirits Dance Theater. I made it around the collaboration of live music. And then as I moved forward, I started feeling like I needed to hear the dancers speak. I needed to hear language in it. And then became collaborations around writers and then with the live music. Um, Always the body telling a story, not necessarily linear. The dance theater definitely gave a nod to that I saw the work as more than uh, dance itself, that the dance needed to embody. I called them dancing personas initially because I didn't think of them as per se actors uh, and they weren't full characters, if you will. So I said they were dance personas, you know? And uh, they definitely, I definitely worked to have every dancer that I work with bring to each piece an embodiment of the dance, not just a regurgitation of the choreography. They needed to be willing to live it. 
and a lot of the uh, processes and techniques which began before I formed Women's Spirit Dance Theater gave that um, uh, breath at that time. It, it, those techniques began to form themselves. And Lori Carlos was a huge impact for me in, um, in some of the ways that I worked, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so my beginning works were always uh, telling a story of some sort, again, not necessarily a linear story, definitely moving out of bits and pieces of what was happening in socio-political environments and um, cultural environments and environments of gender. I mean, all of those little pieces were always moving in and out of the work. Yeah. And this is from Instagram. Another person asks, what would you say your biggest inspirations are as a choreographer? I know you touched on this a little, but I know I'd love, we'd love for you to, we'd love to hear it again. We'd love to hear it again. Yes. Well, definitely um, um, Bobby Wynn was a huge inspiration for me in that she taught me how to talk process all night long. I can get up inside of the container and talk about the minutia of the moment. And I love that about her. Uh, I've already talked Calvin. Um, uh, I've already mentioned Lori Carlos, who's another huge um, um, influencer on my work. And watching uh, Teeny Town uh, with uh, Robbie McCulley and uh, Jessica Hagedorn, uh, the way that they embodied uh, speaking uh, really influenced my work. Um, you know, I did, a, I did a, as a presenter, I was at the Catherine Dunham Institute and Catherine Dunham was still alive at that point. And I was there to present. And I, I did this piece that was a combination of choreographed and directed, movement directed work. And we performed it in front of um, uh, Catherine Dunham. And I said to her, you know, uh, I thought about you when I was making this and Catherine Dunham said, no girl, that was all you. And she said, and, and it's, you know, she really gave me that nod, like you are breathing in your own container. And it was like much respect for that. So, um, yeah, the way Sekou Sundayata would, would, would speak a line of poetry, um, definitely influenced my visual capacity of what I saw. Um, theater hugely influenced how I thought about dance. And then in my early college years, I, I um, had the, the privilege of um, <laughs> seeing, um, oh, Meredith Monk. And this woman, Elina Mooney, who did a piece of Meredith. And just the simple opening and closing of a mouth, just that one gesture as the dance made me start thinking about dance in a different way. So that was definitely impactful. Um, another woman, Brenda Way uh, of ODC. And their thing was when I would watch some of the early ODC pieces, the stage would have 20 different in things going on, much like I'm sitting here talking to you, someone is out there mowing their lawn, someone is, is, is next door probably cooking, and yet and still all together there's a synergy of something happening and it's called we're living in this community, right? Uh, and so that gave me a, a, a reference as the stage, I could paint it any way I wanted to, um, and definitely began to think of that. Uh, disco dancing influenced my work. You know, I was definitely a disco dancer at one point in time in my work, um, in my early days. And there's something about spinning and turning that um, really impacted me at that time. James Brown influenced my work, you know, Funkadelic, you know, Parliament, Bootsy, you know, all of that, all of that music influenced my work in that it clarified the one so strongly that I love to dance on the, the beat after the one. Boom. Boom. Yeah. I love to do the beat after the one, which came from live jazz music. So yeah. And 
my mother. And what do you do? This is another question from Instagram. And what do you do when you are blocked for inspiration? Cry first. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't cry first. I walk in circles. Oh. Yeah, I walk in circles. Walking. I walk in circles. I walk. I walk. I walk to clear the path. And it means that I need to start writing. If I'm blocked, I need to start writing because it means too much life has gone on and I've not cleared the passageway out. You gotta clear it out. You know, there's a lot of life going on all the time, especially right now, there's a lot of life going on. So we gotta learn how to clear our passageways. We gotta keep them clear. And I drink lots of water. If I'm blocked, what I use for inspiration is getting healthy. It means I've been in the container too hard. Yeah. And what advice would you give to upcoming artists of color? Who due to everything that has happened, I mean, I would be speaking this if it if all that has happened had not happened. Yes. But now, due to everything that has happened, it is so important that we understand that we stop responding to the gaze. Hmm. We cannot respond to the gaze. We have to be present in our authentic self, that I am this, that black joy that you said you wanted to embody because, mm -hmm. yes. We have to get to who we are and we have to stop thinking that that looks, sounds and is one way. Because it's not. No. That's the trick that we've been made to think that it looks, sounds in one way. And it's not. And as soon as we continue to keep trying to hold on to what that needs to look like, what that needs to sound like, what story needs to be told, the rhythm of that story, what it all needs to look like. As soon as we fall into that, we're inside of the biggest trap ever. That is the colonization. That is the residue of that. You have to speak authentically to who you are as an artist. And what does that mean to make that work? And to begin to ask the question of when did that impulse come? Yeah. Do you feel that there is, actually wait, before I ask that question, now I wonder, okay. in spite of, let's say all that we've been hit these past few of recently, Let's yeah. go pre pre coronavirus, pre pandemic, panoramic, pre whatever we're calling it now, <laughs> pre vid. What advice would you give to the young artists of color then? Like if it was March, if it was March, um, what year was last year? Twenty twenty. If it was January fifteenth, twenty twenty, we we weren't aware of all that was to come. What would you give as advice then? And I think now I'm gonna hit you with a curveball too. Yes. If you were in, in the in the night when you were in that moment of rent from that per, like point of view in your early careers, what advice would you give to the young artist then, and mm. versus like the young artist before Corona? And I know we've got the young artist post Corona, so okay. there's a lot of young artists. <laughs> there, there is a the young artist thread would still always be be true to yourself. Mm. Yes. Because oftentimes the industry of making work, you can get really caught up in trying to make the work that is the trend of the day to be current. Yes, you wanna, yes. You, you, like everybody's pushing you to be current, be on point. But what if that's not what your, what story, what, what is in your body to wanna tell? Yes. You know? So yes. it's hugely important to get permission to tell the story that you want to tell because otherwise we do a disservice to artistry because by you telling your story maybe it doesn't impact hundreds and thousands of people maybe it doesn't but maybe it impacts one person who by you telling the story that you chose to tell with the complete authenticity authenticity of it meaning something to you and that you're excited by that exploration. 
yeah? If it impacts one person, then that's done everything that it needed to do. And yes, that one person could also be you. Because part of being an artist means that we needed to give voice to something. We needed to give voice to something, whether that was something that we lived through that then made us want to give voice, or whether that is um, a calling that we just feel called to, to give voice. You know, we as artists come to being artists because there's something in our, our life that requires a voice. And all we need to do is pay honor to that and do it and quit shutting it off, quit shutting it off. So I would say that the, the through line would be to be you and to truly be you. And if you're a maker of work, to make sure you're making from your voice. Yes, and sometimes, yeah, we sometimes we gotta do the gig to do the trend, to do the thing so that we can get paid to do the better than that. Sometimes there is that, that's okay but do it from you because otherwise you're not gonna be able to sleep at night. You won't be able to wake up and look at yourself. And in order to see yourself, you have to be yourself. And if you can't be yourself, then you're not gonna see yourself. Boy, I sound like I was doing some kind of weird poetry there. <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, that's hugely, hugely important, hugely important, yes? Yeah. I would say that one of the things someone once told me which social media definitely, okay, so this is what I would say now. Someone once told me many years back, yes, oh, you're an artist, don't worry about marketing. Don't worry about, you know, the things, the producing aspect, yeah? Just make the work. Let the venues handle that for you, yeah? That's a huge mistake. You as an artist must think of yourself as a business. Okay. Yes. So if you want to be a full-time artist who feeds themselves, breathes it in, wakes up to do it, goes to sleep to do it. As a full-time artist, the commitment is to understand that it is also, there's a business that contains that artistry which requires networking, reaching out, um, building a team of people around you that care and that um, have real interest in your work and, your, and seeing you be successful. But now also we have this, this world called social media, which I ignored for a long time. And it really wasn't, I mean, I didn't completely ignore it. I post it, but I post it more from the place of, connecting with people. Oh, he said something. Oh, that interests me. And I would respond back, you know, or I would see an article and I would post that article. So it was really more expressing how I felt about myself in the world. But now that world is very much one monetized. So it is another artistic stream that we don't think about in that way. But two, it is also the new calling card. It is how people are getting to know who you are and your work. And that presence is different than it was. Um, well, social media wasn't a thing when I came through. Even when rent happened, social media was not a thing. It was just beginning to be a thing, but it wasn't a thing. Now it's a thing, yeah? Which the beautiful thing about that is you as an independent artist can create an audience around your work already now you know, at, at a lower cost than it would be for you to step in and rent space, yes, to rehearse and do all the things that you do in the real world. So now this container is your, your laboratory. And I think that a lot of um, young artists aren't necessarily thinking of that. They're having fun with it and you should have some fun with it. But you should also be clear that it's a public platform and it's defining you every minute that you step out. So be clear that you, you need to have passion and belief in what you're stepping out. And I'm not good and organized with it at all. This is something that I am still learning, but I'm here to tell you that it does matter. It really, really does matter. Yeah. 
in a way that I don't want it to. <laughs> but it does. It's the new calling card. How do you it's navigate real. social media as an artist? I mean, for you as an artist, how do you navigate your virtual calling card of like social media? How do you navigate that? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> terribly I am literally just beginning to think about it like I said I didn't think about it I mean I was out in the real world moving around making things happen this way and that way you know coming you know watching the cast come off the stage and you meet the audience or you go to the hotel room you shut yourself down so you can have a good night's rest and so that you can maybe work on this other idea that you're trying to prove I wasn't thinking about it you know, not in that way. Um, but now really COVID, that's a big shift for me. I have realized that uh, um, social media is a thing. Mm. You know, even when the cast in this recent touring of, of Rent that we did, I noticed that they would pull the cast together and give them a social media etiquette training before we even began rehearsal. They were schooled on how to use social media, what they were gonna do with the social media, um, how to take over Instagram pages, and what did that mean? And that really began to build like a, an intimate relationship to the work and drew audiences and let people know because it's something about people knowing in an intimate way, yes, the working, process of the artist, um, you know, is something about that then then draws people in. Um, so yeah, it's a training. And I, I, I don't say that I have a handle on it at all. I say what I'm beginning to do is turn to um, people who do have a handle and begin to sort of look and talk about that. And then yet and still um, maintain some of my impulses of the reason why I get on you know, but um, I haven't been branding in that way with social media, but I have been um, aware of it as a source to gather research information. Um, you have to be diligent because there's a lot of lies on, on uh, social media for sure. A lot of false news, right? So, but I'm, I'm learning it. I am learning it. I am learning the rhythm of social media. This is probably my, I don't know if this is my first Facebook Live. I think it is maybe my first Facebook Live. You know, I see that button there. I can press it and do something with it, but I haven't. Yeah. And now I'm learning again that they that um, the social media platforms are monetizing your image, my image, you know, and what we're doing in this way. So I'm now looking at how do we monetize it? How do we as independent artists take control and benefit and tell the story that benefits us. There is a great playing field that's happening now and uh, with um, social media in a way that we can control. Yeah, and I would suggest every black artist and BIPOC artist and artist period, go check out um, uh, a woman named Lady Phoenix, who I think is profound she, it can be found, yes, Lady Phoenix is, is her handle, is her handle. And um, she is doing amazing things with artists of all else in getting them to look at the box in a very different way. This yeah. is another question from the audience. Somebody asks, hi, Marlies, is there any project you would like to work on? Oh, I definitely would like to a project that I'm creating, I definitely want to see my seed project emerge and, and complete itself. And then there's another project that I never really got to complete in the way that I envisioned it. And it is because we were way ahead of our time. And it was a, a piece to deal with the impact of media on the shape of identity. Now, this piece would resonate very well because we are so connected to our device and our information and how we're flowing is so connected to what comes over that device. Yeah. So um, it, it is a piece that I would like to still see happen now. 
I wonder because there I, I was I wanna see Salt City play again. Oh, I actually have a question for you about Salt City. Yeah. Um you worked as co-choreographer, co-director, and dramaturg, and I wonder if you could talk about the difference in a pro in working on a project as such Salt City as a co-director working mm -hmm. as a co-choreographer, and then taking on that role separately where you're not co with nobody is just dra dramaturg. What are those yeah. like three differences and how do you approach differently like from all these different angles, I think, and all these different things being fed to you as an artist. How do you like hit each mark? And also like where, where, where yeah, I just have what's, what's going on through you <laughs> during those moments. Yeah. Well, you know, I, that is the place where listening becomes so important, you know? Um, so I had to listen to Jessica Caremore and her understanding of her poetry. I had to listen to the poetry that may be saying things that she might not have even seen, you know? And then Aku Kadoga, who um, or originally started collaborating with her uh, over at Spelman College to dream Salt City into existence. On the initial push, she directed it on her own. Um, so several things happened. When we got up inside of the pieces of poetry and bringing them together onto script, one of the things that we realized, or uh, I realized, is that the things that weren't said in the poetry needed to be a bridge to helping us understand where we were going when moving to the next piece of poetry. So really that, that language that never was heard on the stage became like a connector of a, 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 um, what the action that needed to happen and what was, the, what was, being ha what was happening that was bringing us to the character now saying this next moment. So what I loved about that process was I felt like I knew the story very well by the time I went through the dramaturgical process with her, you know? So there was really that listening that then allowed me to have a vision around the work. And then I had to listen to Aku who had a particular vision around the earlier work, which the script then and the script now, it, it shifted because now we were moving uh, part one and part two or act one and act two, there was really a one act and we weren't even thinking about it as an act. We were thinking about it more like a choreo poem. Although I think when it emerged on the stage, I think it stretched the form of choreo poem even further to something else that was not musical theater was not straight ahead theater. Uh, it embod embodied that techno music and house music was in it. So there was something driving in that, but we would definitely move beyond the form or the container, in my opinion, this is my opinion of, of a choreo poem. So I had to then listen and then I became the bridge I felt between the new script, you know, that emerged um, bringing together all the pieces of Jessica Caramore's amazing writing, and then Aku's ability to visually see the world. Um, and then, you know, bringing in the collaborators, Carlos uh, Fun, who came in, and uh, he moved from the imagery that was projected onto the stage, and um, Andre, uh, uh, who the, the lighting designers who, whose lights were living, you know, they were living on the stage. So there was this amazing uh, process of listening to all the components. And part of my gift as a director in the room is seamlessly beginning, seamlessly being able to integrate all the components in a way that gives breath for each to help tell the story. And I think that that was the gift that I really brought. Yeah. Another question I have for you, um, if you could talk about it, was your work with Peter J. Sharp Theater Company 8. 
um, in that piece. I know it talks about these different elements of the world being at war and nature, and you've talked a lot about how you take in nature around you and people from creating different movements and how you choreograph. Just what was that process like? What what did it mean? And also like the the where does that piece eight stay within you in your soul? Ah, okay. And like your heart. It's so interesting that 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 that's the piece that you would you would um, gravitate to. Um, when I did that piece, it was for um, Joffrey Ballet Summer Intensive. So the piece was done on the summer intensive uh, school of students that were gathered. And then we performed it at the Peter J. Sharp, um, which is with symphony space at that time, or now it's something else, I don't know. But anyways, we performed it there. And um, yes, when I thought about that piece, I was really thinking about the world and is it self-destructing by our um, disregard for paying attention that we are a part of an ecosystem? Not that the ecosystem is there to serve us. So I was really beginning to think about that. And so eight was really an expression of collaborating with the eight group of dancers inside of that container, each embodying some superpower to, to move us through um, a, a, a portal of understanding that we are a part of this ecosystem and that the animals, the trees, the, the, the air, every aspect, we are a part of it. And if we don't participate as a part of it and keep water, every aspect of it, we are a part of it. And if we don't participate as a part of it and continue to just pillage it, yes, that it will disrupt. And my mind at that time was even thinking that earth itself is part of a greater ecosystem called the galaxy. And what it would be if it did not correct itself, it would be the toxic arm of the galaxy. And would it need to self-destruct? So the eight were charged with restoring balance, which meant that that which was not in balance needed to be eliminated. And nature took its own course to do that. That's what it was back then. And it seems like we're in the middle of a nature response right now, aren't we? Yeah. I'm gonna ask another question here for you then. Um, in one of your bios, as I was looking through many of your works, you've been described as um, being a modern and postmodern choreographer. Wow. Now I know those may be styles of dance and I was wondering if you could talk about what, what is the difference in terms of the dance world to be a modern and postmodern choreographer. And also I think as an artist, cause I would say you've been on, you and many black women too have been on this thing of cr creating works that become trends. Like mm -hmm. till this day, a bunch of theater kids could go into an IHOP, slam their heads on the table and move their heads to La Vivo M because it was, you were at, you were not just a modern but you were literally the forefront and the creator of a new trend and a new, in the art really imitating life and creating a new life. And um, even with dance hack it too, like that is still something that a lot of places are rushing to. Like how do we keep this Zoom platform alive? So I wonder for, as a, as a dance artist, what does that mean literally um, post-modern and a modern choreographer? But then as an artist, what does it mean to be a modern artist and a post-modern artist for you? Like that definition, how would you define that. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about all of these definitions, these container definitions, is that they really all are striving for the same thing. When you think about modern, it was an, an, an a push away from um, ballet, from the forms of ballet. And it, it, when I was in college, modern was discussed as 
its own revolt against that container. Yes. And to be able to um, uh, uh, express yourself in the way you wanted to express yourself as a choreographer. That's what modern was at that time. But then it became contained down to specific artists, choreographers who were considered modern, right? And so then postmodernism was another uh, uh, revolt against that, in a sense, yes. Again, without the formalness and a different type of, of uh, um, approach to the work, if you will. Again, still moving from that place of um, the way I see it, the way I envision it and moving into it. But then again, it got strapped down to a particular aesthetic and style that represented that. Um, I, I've often called myself contemporary dance theater is the way I discuss myself, which now contemporary is becoming yet again, another container of what that looks like. So we just, as a society of people, I think, love containers. We start off with something very freeing, yes, that is supposed to just allow you to be, allow you to express yourself, and then that is modern. Well, now that is postmodernism. Well, now that is contemporary. And then it becomes, now stylistically, it looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like this. And so um, I think that I let everyone else do the defining. And I try my best to not overly define myself. So but then how do you does define often how I think about it? Yeah. So then how do you then separate um, letting others define you and you define you? Because a lot of times as artists, they tell us, find your style, find. Find, find your, your, I don't know what the word is that they say, but there's a thing that they, your, 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 yes. your, your thing, you know? Yes. Your juice, yeah, find your juice, find your find something. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, how do you then, as like, especially as a young artist, when you're in a training situation, you're getting all these notes, but you're also like, okay, I know who I am and how to engage in the work, but it's also like, when, when, when do you say, no, this is me defining me? as an artist to, to those outside voices are like maybe you could I don't know would you want to cancel out the pirouette here or like you know you know what I'm saying where do you start to write your own dictionary yeah if you will yes 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 my brain has to say one thing though another great influencer of my work was Diane McIntyre mm -hmm. now I'm gonna go back and answer what you just said um uh okay hmm there will always be definitions coming at me from society as a whole and from the industry in specific. But unless you've seen the totality of my work, you cannot define me because you don't know me. Yes. <laughs> you really don't know me. You only know me because you've seen this. And so therefore it's this, or you've seen that because it's, therefore it's that. Yes, or you saw this talk and therefore it's this. But every day I remake myself based on what I'm hearing, what is, what is brought to me, what collaborators are in the room, what words I'm reading, what music I'm hearing, what story I wanna tell today may not be the same story I wanna tell tomorrow, yeah? And for me to have less than that as my capacity to breathe as an artist chokes me. And I'm most important in living fully. So if that means that now I'm gonna make a backyard dance, that's what that means, you know? Because authenticity for me is huge. And if I can't be, and if I can't see it from the place that I'm inspired to see it, it's not important to me because it's not my artistry, it's not my authentic self. And I know that place because I've lived in my life at a time where I could not or felt like I could not express myself completely. And that was uh, like death 
it was like a living death. Mm. Yeah. And so it's, it's hugely important that you create your own language. And that was one of the things Lori Carlos taught me. When I started talking in press about gesture dances, you know, and, and people wanted to know, well, what does a gesture dance mean? You know, and I would explain what a gesture dance meant in my interpretation. And then someone said, well, I'm doing that. And now you can look up and you can see gesture dances used as a piece of language in a lot of writing now, you know, but back then it wasn't being utilized that way. And so Lori, Lori Carlos really, and, and Calvin was very much a big part of this too, about creating your language. What is your language? Create your language, create your aesthetic, you know, and be willing to make up the language for it. Now, they will laugh at me because they know that I have gone and taken that a step, forward, a step further to making my own language sometimes. Sometimes it's not the language that's written in any dictionary language. Like gesture dance, as you just said, like yeah. on the red carpet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I think it's hugely important as an artist, that is the freeing, that is the freedom, yeah? If you feel like what you gotta do. Now, I, I think that also it's important to know what's there so that you know that you're not necessarily remaking the will, but it's also okay to feel like you're inventing in the moment. and give it give it is give it your own language and it's also okay to change your mind um another person asks hi marlise is there a video of salt city available to the public Woo! there is not a video of salt city to the public um but everybody should go over and and tap jessica care more and say we want to see Salt City rise again. I think she would want to see it rise again too. I mean, it's huge when you're trying to produce and you know, she's a producer. Um, she produces her work like all of us artists do out on this, on the chain, right? We're all producing. We don't get recognized often as producers, but we are all producing the work and trying to build the, the financial base foundation so you can get the work done is not always easy, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's worth, worth hearing from again because there was something very powerful about Salt, the character, um, working in this legacy of the minds that was his own commodity, you know, and then leaving family to, to because she visioned something further for her life and moving through time, hundreds of years and a second later, arriving in the future where her existence of her uh, of the mind that she came from was no more but the residue the generation the legacy of people that came from that tribe now reinvented in this future time and those connections i mean there's something very powerful about legacy and how we envision ourselves into the future and what does it mean to let go the past and step forward? And what does that mean? What is the what is the danger of it? What is the what is the power in it? It's it's a piece that needs to be done again. Yeah. You know, I know that you talk about Salt City being a piece that needs to be done again. Yeah. I I see that now with Ren. And I know you choreographed and directed the 20th anniversary tour and the 25th anniversary tour, the final tour. Too. I didn't direct it. I didn't you direct it. Choreographed. I, sorry. I choreographed it. Yes. Yes. You choreographed uh, those tours. And yeah. I wonder that idea of legacy. Mm. How has it been um, as a choreographer? the changing, like keeping the originality of Rent mm. and the fir that first, the grit, the, the, the from the ground up New York theater workshop transfer to Broadway in that 90s yes. grit. And how does that, how do you sustain the legacy while it is changing for newer audiences? Mm. Yes, it's an amazing thing. I do know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an amazing thing to have someone 11 years old walk up to you and say, Rent changed my life. And I'm like, but you were not born with that. <laughs> but, and, and I understand that it did because it allowed your, uh, it allowed you, it gave permission 
to be who you are. And that is the love of rent. That is the love story that is selling, right? So the way that we kept it fresh and it stays fresh to this day is every new cast that steps into the room, we listen to the bodies in the room. So even though we are really um, uh, sharing the same um, story, the same script, the same music, yes, and, and the same choreography, they're, the way that they enter into that piece of information, they are embodying it, bringing forth who they are in relationship to the character. That bridge is always present. It's never about getting up on stage and just doing the character. And that's kind of what gives it its freshness. If there was, this is just a funny question now, because I'm learning. If there was a character in Rent mm -hmm. that you relate to, who, which, who would it be? Huh, that's interesting. That, that is very interesting. And I would say probably Tom Collins in a way. Oh, why? Well, why Tom Collins? Well, because he had that, that, that um, Tom Collins was willing to walk through change. You know, letting Angel in his life in that moment that he let Angel in his life was, he was listening, he was aware, he was connected to himself, you know, in a beautiful way that allowed him in that moment after just being uh, uh, tumbled, right, that he would connect with Angel in the way that he connected him, with him in that moment. And the, the Pied Piper of him, the way that he, you know, in Santa Fe connected and always respected that community that was uh, without, yes, as having as much honor as those with. And he respected them. And you could see that in the way he was crafted, you know? Um, and the tenderness of the moment when he says goodbye to his to his lover you know there's a tenderness about him that i a, a real humanity in who he he is and and i could say that of angel too yes i could definitely say i could connect to angel in that way as well um i would say you know there's probably a little piece of me in in a lot of those characters i wonder now to you say this phrase walking through change and yeah. I'm gonna ask. This is a this is a follow up question now to walking through change. Yeah. Where have you found yourself as Marlies the artist scared to walk through change, and what was your advice and what motivated you to take that walk? Because in fact, it is something that is scary. And yeah, let's. And my other question is, in addition to like when have as you have you been scared of walking through change? When have you and Marlies been excited about walking through that change? But like, how have you still remained grounded in that time? Ooh, that's a huge one. Well, okay, I would honestly say that uh, one of those moments was the transfer between doing Feathers at the Flame uh, and then doing Red. I had just come down from producing Feathers. I was exhausted because when you produce as an independent artist, you are giving everything, including your rent, you know, so to make it happen. Yeah. And um, so when I, when I got offered to um, submit for rent, I almost didn't submit not because I wasn't interested in it, but because I was exhausted. 
I really felt like I needed to just stop. And I remember um, Cooper Moore, another great collaborator of mine said, Marlies, don't turn down anything, you know, just go ahead and, and submit. You never know what can happen from that. I think you should go ahead and submit. And so I, I took that to heart. And then the, the final moment of it was when um, I got a call saying that our tour, my company's tour, Moving Spirits Dance Theater's tour that was going to happen uh, in March was now moved to January. Hmm. And I didn't expect that. So suddenly now, it meant I have to figure out how I get a completely different work out on the road. I did not think to go, oh, can we do the same work that we did? Well, first it would have been more people on the road. So, you know, I was trying to figure this out and suddenly rent became something that I now needed to, to do versus, you know, choosing to do it because I was ready to do it. And I was tired. I was really tired. So I was uh, a little frightened and I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call it fear, but I was definitely feeling a sense of, can I do this? Do I have enough stamina to go into a, a, a completely new work? Can I in fact get the company back up in this completely different work? Do I have enough to handle both of these things, these productions at the same time? having come off of such a big push, you know? And I just didn't have that answer. But like always, you step in that room, you catch that breath, you're in the environment, the music starts moving, you know, choices start happening and you find yourself, you know, in it. Yeah. So now, this is close soon. Yeah, we're gonna close soon. What <laughs> is that question, Rory? I know this is the one that's gonna close us down. I really think this is going to be the one that's going to close us down too. Um, okay, maybe, okay, two that might close down too. Um, the first question I have is, so as a student sometimes, especially a student in the arts, when you do, you get up, you do a piece of work, like you may work a monologue this amount of times, you've worked this and you're constantly receiving notes about how to be better. Mm. And I wonder what is your advice to students when you are receiving these notes, but what's the advice between deciphering notes for like when it is against your identity and when it is for your identity? Because at the end of the day, our, our identity is asked to be brought into the work. So it's like, yeah. how do you as a student stand up for like, um, not necessarily, you don't have to tell them the note because actions speak louder than words on the stage. It's rather like, when do you know when a note isn't for you and how wish, how should you deal with that? Right. From a teacher point of view, I wonder. Mm. Well, there's a couple of things. One is, as an artist, you have to trust the vision of the container. And the container is your collaborators or your director, uh, choreographer, who's there to work and help you embody the script. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a, a particular idea or vision of it. However, learning to hear what the note is and being willing to embody it from um, the way you're breathing into that character. Oh. Yes. yes. Embody it. Do the note. Yes. Um, is an important skill because it allows the potential for growth. Mm -hmm. And so if you cut that off as an actor, you are constantly um, engaging the vessel for the service of the story, right? As the dancer, you're, you're, in, you're, you're, you're embodying to service the vision of the piece, the work, yes? So as a performing artist, as a musician, you are giving over your artistry of your instrument to service the composition or the listening of the concept. Of you, yeah. Yes. So, and if you don't give it over, then, um, 
then you don't have an opportunity to experience yourself and your own expansion. And sometimes that expansion, you're very clear, does not feel good on me. At the point that it doesn't feel healthy to you, that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be in a container and the working process, either you're not really ready to be there in that way, or uh, the, the container of collaborators are not there to work in a healthy way. They're working in an abusive manner, yes? And so it's very important to know the difference in that. But if you're in a container that really is about the work and about the expansion of the artistry to get at the work, you gotta breathe into it. You gotta breathe into it so that you can have a real opinion. Don't let your headspace think yourself out of it. Okay. Oh gosh, I feel like I could just talk and listen to you talk all day. Oh, okay. My last question, because um, <laughs> <laughs> this is just the amount of gems you've dropped. I'm like, I feel like I'm in diamond rush because I'm trying to pick up all the gems. Um, Sorry. But <laughs> My last question is because I tend to, I am producing a lot of my own work as an artist. And I know a lot of my peers are trying to produce their own work too. Yes. Where do you start in producing your own work? I mean, not necessarily where do you start, but how do you, even if you can't, like when you don't have the money to pay others mm. and you don't have money, but you got the people who could bring the work to life. Where, where, right. What do you, what do you do? Right. Do it. Do the work. If you don't have the money to pay others, I mean, let's define what that means. Yeah. In my time, I was paying what amounted, what amounted to car fare or token, or I would bring food into the rehearsal to feed people because I know a lot of artists are starving in not a good way, you know? So communicate honestly, first of all, you don't have a budget, I don't have a budget and be respectful that some that may mean that somebody can't work with you right then and there. That's okay. That's all right. Move, take an action forward in whatever way possible. And if that means that you can get in the room and play, you can get in the Zoom room and play, you can get in the real room and play, play. If it means that you need to write, you know, write. If you need to compose, compose. Whatever it is, you have to walk towards the idea that you have. Put one action towards it. I was just mentoring a, a young, young lady who I gave an assignment to, to, she wants to make a film. It, this type of film that she's gonna make is gonna be a new adventure for her. Mm -hmm. And my assignment to her was to make the film with what she had. Just play out one of the scenes. Even though she was waiting for herself to get the budget and to do the this and the that and the site and, blah, 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 and go to school for that part of it because she felt like she also needed more knowledge, my suggestion was move forward on any aspect of it now. And so that's how I would say, that's what I would say to you. You're producing, you want to do something, you don't have the money, you don't have the budget. What aspect of it can you do now? And I would, this is the last one. What would be your oh, advice? Oh, you said that two questions ago, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to see if you would catch Lord, me in it. You can absolutely get in contact with me because I am enjoying talking to you. Oh, so, well, I would know, love to get in contact out. with yeah. you after you this. Email me and send me some questions. And for everyone out there, they can absolutely follow me on social media. And what yeah. is your social media? So we can actually can put it in the comment section. Ashley, put it in the yes. social media. Yes, you can get me at Joy Dances 8 on Instagram, at Marlies Yearby on Twitter, and on Facebook, it's at Marlies Yearby. Yeah. Great. 
Yeah. Once again, Marlies, it was such an amazing time talking to you, to everyone who joined us in our live. Thank you so much for tuning into this conversation. Thank you for your questions on Instagram and Facebook. Tune in next week for the sit down series, chapter two, where we sit down with amazing playwright and writer, Stacey Rose. We look forward to seeing all your beautiful questions and presences in our virtual space. Marlies, we cannot thank you enough. I'm just going to give you a Zoom round of applause here because you deserve it. And we thank you for coming to talk to us here at the University of Minnesota. Thank, Thank you very much to everyone who watched. I'm sure this will be up on the Facebook and if not, stay tuned for us to post our live recording. Have an amazing evening. Have an amazing weekend. Thank you. Thank you.